represented and um, people doing stuff from across the region. So uh, yeah, we're really excited to be doing this and I, and I really appreciate it because there's a lot of talks happening all at the same time. In fact, all on burners at the same time. So um, if you decide you want to like watch the first five minutes and then go across the hall and come back while you're standing, totally get it. But you do. Okay, did I stall on you? Um, so my... Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague Bill DeLuca. Um, we're colleagues at UMass and with the Meditation Center at Science Center. And and Hill is talking about relative impacts of climate change and urban growth. Yeah, do you want um, the auto the no, this is enough close okay. proximity to just go through here. Thank you for coming. I just wanted to um, start by just kind of continuing the flow of negativity from the <laughs> <laughs> you know, as I was listening to them, I was like, oh crap, my first slide is like another downer. But we'll 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 start at the bottom and, and kind of um, head up from there. So there was a recent um, World Wildlife Fund publication that showed that about 58% of um, vertebrates throughout the globe are um, being reduced in population size. And that's just kind of a broad number, it doesn't mean a lot, but you know, it's still pretty scary. When we think about what the typical stressors are that lead to that, uh, most of the times we think about stuff like climate change, as we just heard of, and we also think about um, land use conversion, um, particularly um, development. And so I just want to talk a little bit about a project that I've been involved with over the past um, six or seven years that have offered us some really um, unique avenues to, one, kind of um, compare and contrast the relative effects of those stressors on wildlife, and two, to come up with some solutions to, um, to kind of um, curb some of those effects. So about seven or so years ago, um, the North Atlantic LCC, um, under the direction of Andrew Milligan, who's here today, had some great wisdom to think about um, some of the solutions here at these really broad scales. These are really broad problems and the solutions for those um, stressors need to occur at broad scales. And so the LCCs, unfortunately, that are um, no longer with us, um, funded our project, which is called the Designing Sustainable Landscapes Project. Um, and the general definition and mission statement of that project was to assess the capability of current and potential future landscapes in the Northeast to provide integral ecosystems and suitable habitat for a suite of representative species and provide further guidance for strategic habitat conservation. Kind of the approach that, that we took to this um, was to really kind of have this co-production of the people who are going to be using this data set and the producers ourselves. And so it was a very painstaking process. Um, but I think it was, it paid off in the end to ensure that um, it ends up being used. Um, we thought about the region uh, more from the Fish and Wildlife Service Northeast Regional perspective, so it included all 13 Northeastern states. It included about 27 organizations, some of which are pictured here, um, approximately 13 state organizations, some NGOs, federal organizations, so it really was kind of this like holistic approach to um, co-producing to develop these um, landscape conservation designs. Um, one of the ways that we started to do this was we started on a pilot watershed of the Connecticut River, and there we kind of really dug into the nitty-gritty details, made some really hard decisions um, over the course of a few years, and once we felt comfortable with some of that, then we scaled up to the Northeast region and um, developed a nature's network, which again is a um, landscape conservation design for the entire Northeast, with the goal of producing a suite of or a set of core areas and connectors. This is about approximately 25% of the landscape that can then be used to prioritize conservation um, decision making, in particular land acquisition um, and management. So this is, both of these websites are up. There's um, a dizzying amount of data that's associated with them. 
But one of the things that was an important part of this process and that I focused on um, that contributed to identifying some of these locations on the landscape was this idea of surrogate species. So throughout the region, a bunch of stakeholders got together and decided on about 31 species that were deemed surrogate species or representative species, so each of which was supposed to represent a suite of species that they're co-associated with. Um, luckily for me, most of them, as you can see, are birds. That's kind of my background, but also that's where the data lies. As we all know, there's tons of bird data across really broad spatial scales, which maybe isn't the case for some of the, the herps and mammals. So for each of those 31 species, we developed a landscape capability model. We defined landscape capability models as the capability of the landscape to provide suitable and accessible habitat. And then, like I said, ultimately they would inform the decision making in the um, landscape conservation design to help us identify specific core areas and connectors. So I'm just going to briefly go through what is um, kind of encompasses these models, just so you kind of have a little bit of an understanding. So we independently modeled habitat capability and climate suitability for each of the species across the whole entire region, put them together, and that's what gave us our landscape capability model. So I'll quickly start by talking about the habitat capability side of that model. Um, this is an example of black burning and warbler. Um, we put together things like um, home range capability, so that represents um, suitable forest types, suitable habitat types, um, suitable seral stages as defined by biomass. Um, we combine that with fine scale development, coarse scale development, habitat quantity. This is one of our more simple models, so it's a nice um, example here. And then what we get is a value between 0 and 1 for every pixel on the landscape throughout the northeastern region. And you can kind of see when we think about black burning warblers, that's about um, where you might expect them. Then on the climate suitability side, we developed um, independently a climate model. So um, this is a logistic, a logistic regression model based on breeding bird survey data. And this was um, the climate data that we got was came from the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. So we basically would just define the model based on breeding bird survey locations and then apply it across the landscape. So once we have our habitat capability model, then we have our climate suitability model, we put the two together and we get our landscape capability model. And the fact that we independently modeled habitat and climate, you'll see, gave us some flexibility in how we look at um, some of the future scenarios. I just want to briefly say, um, we independently evaluated our models using eBird data, even though they were, because they were built with breeding bird survey data. But then there have been two papers that came out that independently evaluated at least our bird models um, using thousands of point count locations throughout the Northeast. So we feel pretty good in saying that our landscape capability models are a good representation of where these species are and how capable the landscape is of supporting them um, in this region. So then a big part of this project was not only assessing the current landscape and current conditions, but also assessing future conditions. So one whole Herculean effort that um, our lab was producing was an uh, urban growth model, we call it the sprawl model, it's recently been published in Landscape <coughs> and Urban Planning. And two really useful products is uh, probability of development across the entire Northeast, again, so every 30 meter cell um, in the Northeast gets a value of 0 to 1 on its likelihood of being developed by the year 2080, which is our future time step. And then we took that product and developed our 2080 land cover map, so it's the best guess of what the land cover will look like in 2080. So that's kind of our urban growth <coughs> side of things. And like I said, we got our climate um, data from the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. The adaptation part is still just killing me. It doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, and so we built our models in 2010, and then we could just easily apply those models to future projections. Again, this is just an example with Black Bernie and Warbler, as you step through time, you can see that the suitability for the species across the landscape um, kind of deteriorates, as you might expect. So then we can put these together, like I said, in, in various different ways and get our, our future 2080 landscape capability. And this um, is beginning to allow us to ask some kind of interesting questions when we start to compare um, climate versus um, urban growth in terms of stressors for these species. Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty when we think about predicting the future, and we're kind of thinking about this on two different axes. 
So we have our uncertainty with how we might see the environment in the future, right? So for climate, we use um, the RCP 4.5 scenario and the RCP 8.5 scenario. And then um, we use uh, the sea level rise product created by USGS. There's no um, scenarios for that um, outcome at all. But then our sprawl model, we have our baseline scenario, which is basically our best guess of what sprawl will look like based on historic changes. And then we basically double the sprawliness of the model and the amount of development on the landscape. So it kind of bookends reality and then maybe kind of an extreme um, example of reality. So this is our scenario gradient of um, what the environment might look like. Might look like. And then we have um, our uncertainty about how species might respond to those conditions. So maybe climate change doesn't exist. I don't know. Maybe you just don't care about thinking about climate change. And so you might just look at habitat change only, only the effects of sprawl. Um, but if you do, if you're smart and you do think that climate change exists and you do think that species will respond to it, there's various ways that they might respond to it. They might track their climate niche just directly and completely, or maybe they're just going to um, respond in a way that they are just contracted to refugia and kind of expansion in new places isn't an option. So these are kind of the ways that we think about uncertainty in our approach. And so, like I said, we have this kind of independent habitat model, independent climate <coughs> model, so we're able to kind of put these together in this kind of factorial approach to look at these different um, levels of uncertainty. And I, I, you, I just have the species list up there really quickly, but there's a really wide range of the species that we were assessing. And we have one which is a brown-headed nuthatch, and you can see that's a more southerly species. It's predicted to move um, further, further north into the northeast. Um, and when we think about the effects of climate change in just the northeast region, it's really important to think about the context of where the species is now and where it's likely to go, because you can't really think about the brown-headed nuthatch the same way you might think about a species like black Burnian warbler, which is a more northern species and is expected to contract further north. So we kind of thought about all of our species on these two axes, where the y-axis is species range center, so it's really just the <coughs> centroid of the shapefile for the species range. And then on the x-axis is the regional responsibility, so what proportion of a species range is within the northeast. So you have low to high, and then you have these general kind of four quadrants here. So in the upper left-hand quadrant, it's more northern species, lower responsibility. That's an example of like a black pole warbler that barely makes it into um, the northeast region. Um, potentially it's shifting out. Maybe it's less of a conservation concern when we think about it, those implications. Um, the upper right-hand quadrant, you have more northern species, high responsibility. So mo this is a salt marsh sparrow. So most of their range is in the northeast. Maybe it's shifting out. Um, maybe that's more of a conservation concern, something we might want to put more resources into. The bottom left-hand corner, southern species, low responsibility, shifting in. Maybe that's not one that we care about as much. I put question marks because I really honestly don't know the answer to how much concern, how much we want to put into some of these species. It's just really um, kind of confusing and complex. And then we have southern species with high responsibilities that maybe are shifting in again, question mark about their concern. So when we put our species on this map, we can kind of see, so this is kind of um, equivalent to the um, latitude of our, our region. And, and you see what you might expect. So there's more responsibility for the species that are centered in the northeast region. Um, and, and it's a good way for us to kind of think about each of these species when we interpret some of the next results just in terms of whether a northern species, southern species, and what kind of responsibility we have for each of them. So I'm going to start to walk you through this and just remember the legend that we have here based on the, the previous map. So each of these boxes here represents one of our 30 species. On the x-axis we have the net effect of urban growth. So as you move further this way there's a, a more of a negative effect. And then on the y-axis, we have the net effect of climate change. So as you move up from the zero line, it's more of a positive effect. And as you move down from the zero line, it's more of a negative effect. And these boxes represent our uncertainty. The, the area of them are defined by those nine um, uncertainty scenarios that we use. So when you look at a species that 
when you look at how long it is on the y-axis, that reflects our uncertainty in its response to climate change. And when you look at how wide it is on the x-axis, that re represents our uncertainty in its effects of urban growth. And you can see those shapes vary quite significantly. The other part to this is each of these lines are kind of the one-to-one the -one line. So when you think about this kind of piece of the pie up here, those, those species, those boxes up there, you can think of as having strong positive climate effects. So they're going to gain from climate change. <coughs> the species inside this piece of the pie are more strong um, urban growth, negative urban growth effects. So maybe climate change isn't going to affect these species as much, but the urban growth and predicted sprawl model will be affecting those species a little bit more. And then down here, these species have more of a strong negative climate effect. So I mean, it, the, the point of color coding this by green and blue is to really not think of this on a species by species basis, and to think of it more from like these species groups that we set up here. But I think it's also good to kind of think of some examples here. So I threw um, a few pictures in. And what do you see like right off the bat? I think it's some of it's a little bit of like no doubt, right? There's a lot of the more northern species here that are having are predicted to have more of a strong negative climate effect. That's what we'd expect. They're shifting north um, out of our region, losing <coughs> landscape capability. But when you look at the green boxes, um, so those are more southerly species. They're kind of scattered throughout. You have some that are going to actually lose due to climate change, um, some that are um, primarily driven by urban growth, and then you have others that um, are going to gain from climate change. Does that make sense? I'm happy to take questions as I go, too. I have no idea where I'm time, but there we go. Okay, cool. So to conclude, my <laughs> comments left. Um, so just a quick kind of general takeaways from the process of developing the um, Connect the Connecticut framework and then um, Nature's Network. Um, I think that the, as painful as it was at times, I think the idea of co-producing some of these um, efforts is really important in ensuring that people feel like they're really part of the process and kind of helps in the buy-in. And, and when we meet with the folks at Fish and Wildlife who are really putting effort into um, promoting this, and we get really good, strong um, feedback from people who are actually using it. I think it was really important that we got into the weeds and the details at this smaller kind of Connecticut River watershed scale, and then we kind of worked out the kinks and then scaled up to, to the region. I think that was really important. And, you know, yeah, we developed this final landscape conservation design of these core areas and connectors, but I think some of the, the components of that process are really helpful um, in asking some of these more novel questions like we were able to do that I just showed you. Um, so to just quickly summarize the actual results, um, you know, not a real huge surprise that northern species typically lose due to else, um, typically lose due to climate change, their um, landscape capability is reduced. Um, but it was a little bit surprising that we had kind of variable results for the more southern species. And then I think one thing that's kind of interesting about this is we, we all can just assume that southern species are going to win and northern species are going to lose. And there's really no data or science behind any of it. And this actually kind of like quantifies, oh, here's a big male thrush and it's definitely going to be more, not definitely, it's still a model, it's still a guess, but we actually have some evidence that climate change is more likely to affect it than urban growth. And here's um, metal lark, we might want to think more about um, urban growth and we want to conserve that species. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Were you surprised that urban growth seems to be not as dramatic as Jesse? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I mean, when you think about how much climate change and how much it will change across the landscape, it basically kind of swamps out at times the, the urban growth effect. And when I talked about uncertainty, I do feel like there's less uncertainty around the urban growth though. Like if it's developed, that habitat's gone. Whatever it is, it's gone, and there's not a lot of uncertainty associated with that. But when we say, oh, this area has now become unsuitable due to climate, we still don't really know what that means. Maybe they are actually just going to stay there. Um, so you know, I was surprised, but then actually seeing how much climate change can like really swamp out that effect, it wasn't as surprising. But, like, just kind of think of it in that context that I just explained, I guess. Yeah. 
Um, in terms of responsibility, did you, I, might have, I must have missed it, but did, how did you define responsibility in terms of, I mean, is it based on the current range? And yeah, so it therefore was the just, relative proportion it was simply, of range? Um, it was simply the proportion, so this is a species brown head nut hatch that would have a low responsibility. It's simply the proportion of its range within, within the northeast. Like, I didn't try and kind of hand wavy figure out responsibility. It's got a definition. It's just the proportion of the range in the northeast region. So responsibility is a little of a wishy-washy way to say that. Um, statistically, it's just a proportion. Mm. So, so we might expect that to change over time too. Yeah, range is yeah definitely. Yep. 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 And, yeah. Does your sprawl model take into account, um, or is there data to allow you to take into account things like um, population shifts away from uh, cities, coastal cities that are going to be affected by That's ocean, a ocean level rise? No. It, it doesn't have, um, we, when we have the two different scenarios, there's the baseline and the, the plus. The plus size just says, let's sprawl out further from cities in general. Um, a big predictor in that sprawl model is proximity to water. So it actually does the opposite, because when you look at where development is in the landscape, proximity, the closer you are to water, is a good predictor of where development is. So it actually pulls people more and more towards the coast. Yeah, yeah, I totally I mean, there is, there is a sea level rise component to it, so at some point that land cover just switches to water. But. <laughs>